We're going to launch a new series today called Fearless When the Battle is Bigger Than You. Fearless when the battle is bigger than you. Anybody face a battle in 2019? Anybody been through a battle? And maybe it's your finances or a relationship or your job. Anybody been through some hard stuff in 2019? Anybody experience anything in 2019, a challenge or a battle that felt bigger than you? Anybody experience that? Let me just say this, and I'm going to tagline for the sermon. If you're not experiencing a battle that's bigger than you, you need to choose some bigger battles. All right, because God doesn't want you to just fulfill your potential. He wants you to exceed your potential. God always is calling his people to do more than they believe they can do. If God was calling you to fulfill your potential, that means you would just be able to do what you can do by your own strength. When we see God meeting people in the scripture, he's always saying, I want you to do something that I know and you know you can't do unless I help you do it. And so God wants us to face some battles, wants us to tackle some giants this year, wants us to move into some things that that he's got for us, some plans and some future for us. Uh, But it's going to require us to face some battles and it's going to require us to do it with courage and with confidence and with this 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 utmost faith that God is with us right in the midst of our battle. I want to I want to encourage us as a church to face 2020 with a fearlessness unlike anything we've ever experienced before to pursue our commitments with fearlessness to fight the battle uh, uh, to have a vision for what God wants for this city and to be fearless about it to step in with boldness the scripture says uh, before the throne of of mercy he's calling us to be fearless in this and some of you guys are facing battles today you're battling uh, you're battling a diagnosis you're battling a failure you're battling uh, you know a health issue you're, you're battling, you're fighting for your family, you're fighting for your relationship, uh, you're facing battles. And I just want to spend the next few weeks exploring how we do that with fearlessness, how we do that with courage. Uh, and we're going, to expend, we're going to spend some time exploring the life of David. And I love, we're going to just be, we're going to be in David. We're going to be looking at his life for about eight weeks. He's an amazing figure in the Bible. He's not perfect. There were some good times and there were some bad times. But David is a guy who kept pursuing God. He kept repenting for his sins and and receiving what God had for him and being taken further and further. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to read you a long passage of scripture that leads up to the the introduction of David. Okay, and I really did. I thought about having everybody stand for this long reading of the scripture today so that you don't just like zone out on me. But my wife discouraged me from doing that because it's a long passage of scripture. She said, please let us sit. So you're welcome. Um, and, um, but I do need you to focus with me on this. Okay. Will you stay, stay focused as we read this scripture? I'm going to read you from, uh, first Samuel 16. This is the introduction of David. This is when the, the prophet Samuel was being called by God to go and anoint David as the new King of Israel, even though watch this, the old King of Israel was still around. Saul was still around. Sometimes we have giants from our past, battles from our past that are still hanging around. And God says, I want you to move on into a new thing, even though the old thing is still hanging around. Because I want to show you how I can introduce a new thing into your life and get you away from that old thing. It's just going to take some time. You're in transition. We're going to have to shift some things, okay? So this is where we're going to pick up. The Lord said in verse, uh, verse 1, chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, How long, Samuel, will you mourn? for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel. I've already moved on, Saul. How long are you going to stay mourning for that which I have already rejected? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Get going. I got something else for you. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how many of you know whenever God says do something and your first word is but? That's not the right response, right? But this happens all the time in the scripture. God says, I want you to go do something. And our first, my first response is, yeah, but, and then I think of 14 reasons why I can't do that thing, right? This is exactly what Samuel does. He says, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. If Saul hears that I'm going to anoint a new king while he's still king, he's going to kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. In other words, you don't have to tell everybody what you're doing all the time. I'm going to let you, you know, ease into this. You're going to use some wisdom. You're going to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So uh, the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. I'm going to tell you what to do. I just want you to do what I tell you. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? The reason they did that is because Samuel was no joke either. So we think of Samuel as this like curmudgeonly old, you know, crippled prophet. He was a general. He was a warrior. He was a, he was a major guy. And so when the elders of this small town saw Samuel coming, they're like, I hope you're coming in peace, not to bring down fire. And so Samuel said, yes, yes, I'm coming in peace. I have come, he said, to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Consecrate yourselves means sanctify, means get all cleaned up, set your, you know, clean, wash your hair, wash your clothes, brush your teeth, shave your face, get ready, get cleaned up, get ready, because I'm going to do something really important, so I need you to get ready. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Aren't you glad I didn't have you stand for the whole reading of the scripture today? Can I get an amen? When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Eliab was the oldest brother. He was Jesse's oldest son. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Then Jesse called Abinadab, that's son number two, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. So then Jesse had Shema pass by Samuel. And then Samuel said, this ain't the one either. This is number three. We're three down. Jesse, then the, the writer just has to skip over the other ones. Jesse then had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Turn to somebody and say, is this all you got? Is that all you got? Is that all you got, Jesse? So then Jesse said, <laughs> I love Jesse's response. Well, there is this one other guy, the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. I didn't even think of him. The runt of the litter is out tending the sheep. Surely you're not considering him for this position. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Somebody say, this is the one. This is the, one. This is the year. Okay. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So we're seeing this picture of God telling Samuel, I want you to let go of some stuff, release some stuff because I've got some stuff for you to do in the future. So I need you to do, I'm gonna preach on this today, release and refill. I want you to release the way you feel about Saul, who I've already appointed, but I've already moved on from. I want you to fill your horn and go anoint David to be the new king. This is release, some, some of us need to release some stuff from 2019 and we need to be refilled by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can do what God wants us to do in 2020. Amen. Um, I might just say amen every once in a while and that's your prompt to go yes amen. Um, preach it, help him Lord, whatever it feels appropriate in that moment. Um, my, my, my son Augustine is five years old. When he was three years old we bought him a little bicycle which was an appropriate bicycle for, for a three-year-old. It had little 12-inch wheels. It had little, uh, it was red, little silver handlebars, and it had Lightning McQueen details, detail, decals on the side. Uh, little Lightning McQueen. Lightning McQueen is like a stock car from the movie Cars, and he's really cool. And, and we even got Augustine a little uh, Lightning McQueen helmet. So now he had, and then he had a little red jacket. So Augustine was just like, he, he just thought he was it in the neighborhood. He had his Lightning McQueen helmet. He had his Lightning McQueen bicycle. He had his red jacket. Sometimes he would just wear it in the house. Just even when we weren't riding bikes, he just, this was his jam. And he was really proud of it. So he was having a blast. We're riding through the neighborhood. But over the years, what I noticed 
is that Augustine was starting to grow out of his Lightning McQueen bicycle. The wheels are like 12 inches, and you know, his little legs are starting to get longer, starting to stretch out a little bit, and it's got an adjustable seat, so for a while I just got the wrench out, adjusted the seat, and then he's fine, right? But after a little while, he started growing out of it. It started to where his knees were starting to hit the little silver handlebars, and, and you know, it was starting to look awkward and be uncomfortable. Meanwhile, he has two older brothers. His brothers were also growing. He's got an older brother, Jameson, and Jameson had graduated up to a 20-inch bicycle, which meant that his 18-inch bicycle was available for Lincoln. So Lincoln graduated up to an 18-inch bicycle, meaning that his 16-inch bicycle was available for Gustin. Okay, are you tracking with me so far? So Gustin was ready, from my standpoint, to move up from the 12-inch bike to the 16-inch bike. So one day I come to Gustin, I go, hey Gustin, we got a nice new bike for you. Used to belong to your brother. It's 16 inches, it's bigger than your bike. Why don't you go ahead and move on up to Lincoln's bike? And Augustine says to me, yeah, but, um, which is what we say when, we, when, when somebody's trying to get us to move into something new. Uh, he said, yeah, but um, it doesn't have any Lightning McQueen decals on it. So my helmet won't match, it's a different color. Like, it's not the right bike for me. I'm just gonna stick with what I've got. So, you know, I've learned over the course of years to not force children into doing stuff. You know, you gotta kind of ease them into things. So I said, okay, all right, we'll just go with that for now. But there is a nice 16 inch bike here. I know it's orange, doesn't have Lightning McQueen decals, but it's a nice bike. So anyway, we, we start riding. Now Jameson's on 20, Lincoln's on 18, Gustin's still on 12. And so you can imagine the disparity in the, in the speed among, you know, those, those three children. And so Augustine, with his little Mike Lightning McLean's little knees banging against the handlebar, going as fast as he can on a little 12 inch bike and just like not catching up to his brothers. And he's panting and he's crying and he's moaning and, and worrying and fretting and upset. And finally, one day we come home from a ride and I say, okay, son, like, would you just try try the orange bike would you just try and just tears in his eyes he's just like no i'm not going to do it right in other words he was actually holding on to the very thing that was holding him back i wonder today if anybody here is holding on to the very thing that is holding you back i wonder if anybody here come on somebody give me at least a groan on that i wonder if somebody here is holding on to something from your past that is comfortable for you, that, that worked for you in the past, but it's not working for you now, and it's not getting you where you need to go. I wonder if somebody's holding a grudge against somebody that, that offended you in 2019 or before. And they said something to you that you didn't appreciate, you didn't like, that was disrespectful, and I'm not gonna have that, and I will not be talked to that way. And now you are holding on to that, and every time you see them, you just, you're gonna make sure that you still got that in place because you don't want them to think that you don't remember what they said to you. It doesn't matter what they say now, I got that. I'm gonna hold on to that grudge. That's my grudge. I'm gonna keep it right here in my pocket. I'll pull it out and look at it if I forget. I'm gonna keep it right here, right? I wonder if somebody, I'm just wondering if somebody is carrying any regret in 2020 that is from an event that you did, you said, you thought in the past. And for whatever reason, if you just are quiet long enough, that little regret will just, it just kind of like, it just pops up on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen of your mind. You know, it's like, the, it's like the, the little screen of your mind. Every once in a while, if you're quiet enough, right? Boom, it just pops up and you remember something that you said or you did. And it fills you with shame. It fills you with regret. You still feel guilty about it. But for whatever reason, you're not letting it go. You're just still holding on to it. I wonder if somebody today, I think I might be talking to somebody, I don't know who, who they are, but I feel like somebody in here is hearing me. I, I, I wonder if somebody today is carrying a wound from your past. You're holding on to a wound. Somebody harmed you, like legitimately, like somebody did something wrong to you and it hurt you. And, and you, you don't wanna let that go because you feel like if you let that go, oh my God, then it might happen again. So I need to hold on to this wound and keep it real close. That way nobody else can wound me again because I'm gonna keep this one real close so I can remember exactly what it felt like so that it doesn't happen again. I just wonder if any of us are holding on to anything from our past 
that we might, that God's saying, hey, you know what? I've actually moved on from that. And I actually want you to release that because I want to fill you with something different. I want to refill you with some encouragement. I want to refill you with some joy. I want to refill you with some power, with some love, with a sound mind. I don't want you to hold on to the fears and the anxieties of your past. I, I wonder if even for some of you, it may be a, not a negative thing, a positive thing. Like you had a picture of what your life was supposed to look like and, and it, was a, it was a good picture, but it's not coming to pass. But instead of moving into a different life, you're still holding on to the dream version of your life that you have been holding on to for a long time. And now it might be a dream job. It might be, you, you won't even move into a new job. You won't find satisfaction in a new career because for whatever reason in your mind, you still had this picture. Right? And you're holding on to it, but it's preventing you from moving into what God does have for you. Or a dream person. Like you have a dream man in mind or a dream woman in mind. And, and, and you, you, you won't even entertain uh, uh, dating somebody else or, or interacting with somebody else or developing a new relationship because you're still holding on to something from the past. I just wonder. I'm just saying, I just wonder. Because Samuel, in this passage, is holding on to something that God is saying, I'm, I, would you please let go of that thing? Because I'm actually trying to move you. I'm trying to move the nation. I'm trying to move everybody forward. But I need you to release that. Fill up your horn and get on your way. Now, it's totally understandable why Samuel was reluctant to do this. Right? And the, the very first reason that he gives is a pretty good reason. Remember, he says, how can I do this? How can I go anoint David? Because if I do, Saul is going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And he's right. Saul would have killed him. Right? He would, he would have killed him. Scripture says, you know, I'll tell you just a little bit of Saul. Saul, at one point, wanted people to join his army. So he chopped up an ox into little pieces, put it on a cart, sent it around Israel, and sent messengers along with it saying, hey, if you guys don't come work for me, this is what's going to happen to you. Saul was a brutal guy. Saul was hardcore. So Samuel says, look, I, I don't really want to go anoint a new king because if I do, he's going to kill me. In other words, he was motivated by one word, and that is fear. He was afraid, right? He was afraid if, if I go do what you're calling me to do, something bad may happen to me. This is something that I, I believe at the very heart, at the very core of each and every one of us. I believe this with all my heart. I believe that fear is the number one obstacle that keeps you from stepping into what God has for you. I really believe this. Fear comes in all different shapes and sizes. We can call it anxiety. We can call it worry. We call it whatever we want. It's fear. And, and the thing with fear is it even disguises itself. Sometimes it disguises itself as wisdom. Sometimes we just go, well, that wouldn't be wise. Well, actually, you're terrified, right? We can disguise it. We can justify it. We get afraid, and we won't step into what God has for us. And sometimes our fears are legitimate. So like Samuel's fear was legit. But God said, okay, well, let me give you some wisdom. I'm not saying to go out and get yourself killed. I'm going to give you some wisdom and discretion, some care about how to do it, right? I want you to be wise about it, but I do want you to move forward in it. I want you to start stepping into something that God has for that I have for you, God is saying. And I want you to not be afraid because I'm there. That, the reason I know this is the number one thing that constrains us is, is because it's the number one commandment in the Bible, that, that, at least in terms of frequency. God says, don't be afraid more than he says anything else. He says, don't, you know, don't commit adultery. Don't lie. Don't steal. Uh, honor your father. He gives you lots of commandments. But the one thing that he says more than anything else is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he always says it right when he's trying to get you to do something that should cause you fear, right? He's, he's inviting you into something that may cause you some anxiety or some worry. And he says, don't be afraid. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to be with you in the middle of it. I'm going to be right there with you. There's really two ways to not be afraid. One is to avoid everything that causes you fear. In which case, you're going to be stuck back in the dustbin of your life, not moving forward into anything. The other way to, to, to not be afraid is to step into the things you're, you're afraid of and to overcome your fear. Is anybody tracking with me this morning? Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to have some fitness trainers come to our 25 days of prayer, fasting, and fitness. We've got a lot of good fitness trainers in our, in our uh, church, and I've been working... Uh, not as much as I should, but maybe more in the new year with Stefan Simmons. He's one of our fitness trainers in our church. And Stefan was trying to get me to lift some weights the other day. And, um, and they, they weren't heavy weights. Um, I, I was just going to tell him they just weren't very heavy. Okay. They weren't very heavy, but he kept making me lift them like a lot of times. 
And there's this point that you reach in exercise, and the technical official name for it is failure. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's when you like reach that point that you cannot do any more of what you were doing. But here's what a trainer will tell you when you hit failure. The trainer will tell you, keep going, keep going. But like you can't keep going because you like can't keep going. That's why it's called failure. So Stefan has me lifting these small weights, but he's having me do it a lot of times. And I reached this point of failure. And I've been around athletics all my life. I've heard coaches do a lot of things, scream, shout, break pencils, throw clipboards, all kinds of motivational techniques, right, to get you to do what they want you to do. Um, Stefan did said something the other day when I was doing this that I'd never heard anybody ever say in that context. I'm lifting the weights and, and I'm like at the point of failure and it's clear because he's getting more of a workout than me because he's like trying to help me lift the weights, you know. And, and, and he, I get this point of failure and he says to me, don't be afraid. It was like the weirdest, I'm like, it was the weirdest thing that I've ever heard anybody say in that context. Don't be afraid of what? Like these are little tiny dumbbells. I could set them down anytime. What do you mean I'm afraid? But the weird thing was I, I was feeling anxious when he said that. So after the set, when I was, you know, after I threw up and, and, and no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> after the set, I go to him, I go, hey man, you said like, most people say, you could do it. Come on, man. You know, you said, don't be afraid. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? He said, well, the, the reality is that uncertainty always produces anxiety. And so when you're, when you're like hitting that spot where like, you don't know if you can do it anymore, then your body is going to be afraid. You're going to feel anxiety because there's uncertainty. So what, and, and then uncertainty will paralyze you. Even though you actually can do more, you don't know if you can do more. So now you're afraid to do more. So now you back away from the very thing that would cause you to be stronger, right? Because you're afraid to step into that. Is anybody still with me this morning? <laughs> Stefan, are you with me? Am I, am I? So, so the reality, the reality is this. All of us feel anxiety and uncertainty when we're being pushed, when we're being drawn into something that is bigger than us. When we're being drawn, we're being called by the Holy Spirit to do something that we're not so sure we can do. When we're being called to, in, into a mission, into a vision of our life that is bigger than us. And God is saying to you today, he's saying to me today, don't be afraid. I always find out, I always find out what my, what, I always find out what my sermons are about, like right before I preach them. It's the weirdest thing. For me, today, literally, an hour before church, I was up in the, in the family center, and I was printing out you know, stuff and getting everything ready. And um, I was talking to Ernest, and I was talking to uh, Tamara. And, and you know, I said, okay, I'm preaching this sermon series. It's called Fearless. And then I was talking to them about it. And then I was like, you know, I'm a little worried about this because, you know, there's so much. It's a long text. And I don't know if I want to be able to preach it right. And then and I'm like, and I'm starting to get worried and anxious. And Ernest says, oh, man, there's this great sermon you should listen to. It's called Fearless. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, the one I'm getting ready to preach. Okay. All right. I got you. Right. So like, God is calling us to, to, this is just me. Like I experience this every day, every day when God is trying to get me to do something that is beyond my ability, I just feel anxiety. I just feel fear. I do it every day. And God keeps saying hundreds of times in the Bible, don't be afraid. I, I just want to share. This is for somebody today. Whatever it is that you're anxious about, don't be afraid of that. God's got you. He's with you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You, you can do what God has called you to do. He always provides the strength, right? Let me go just a little bit deeper. I'm not going to preach long. Samuel overcomes the fear. Samuel says, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So he goes to do it. But there's a, there are other obstacles to actually accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish. And sometimes the fear is just the surface thing. Sometimes you go, okay, I know I'm afraid. And I'm, I'm going to go, get through that fear. And I'm going to do it, right? So Samuel says, I'm going to do it. Then he goes, but he almost blows it the second time. Why so? The scripture says, when they arrived, meaning the sons of Jesse arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. In other words, Samuel was about to anoint the wrong guy, right? You know why? One word, familiarity, familiarity. He was used to doing what he had always done. You see, Samuel had anointed Saul before. 
And if you read the scripture about Saul, the scripture says Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. He was tall. He was strong. He was good looking. He looked like a king. And when Samuel anointed Saul, that worked, right, for that period of time. When Samuel saw Eliab, the oldest, tallest, strongest son, he said, surely this must be the guy. This is familiar to me, so this must be the right thing. This must be, this must be what I'm supposed to do because this is what I did in the past. How many of you want 2020 to be better than 2019? Listen, if you want 2020 to be better than 2019, that means you're going to have to do some things differently in 2020 than you did in 2019, right? Because familiarity is not going to get you where God's trying to take you. God is saying, look, I'm, I'm not going to do it the same way every time. You know, one time Jesus, when he was trying to heal a blind man, he spit into the mud and then he put the mud on his fingers and he put it on the guy's eyes. You remember that story? Anybody ever read that story? You know how many times he did that? One time. He didn't do it the same way every time. Sometimes we hold on to the way things used to be because they worked for us in the past. Sometimes we're holding on to a 12 inch bicycle because two years ago it worked, right? Sometimes we're holding on to ideas and patterns and thoughts and, 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 and activities that worked for us in the past, but they're not going to work for us. But we're afraid to move on because they're familiar. Come on, somebody help me out this one. They're familiar to us. I'll tell you this. When, when we started the church uh, for the first three or four years, for the first three or four years, whenever I preached, I would bring to the platform, some of you remember this, a 14-page transcript of my sermon. I mean, I'm not even joking. Every word right here. And I would, like, try to act like I was just talking, but then I would also be kind of, like, reading and talking at the same time. And I kept, some of you remember that. And I kept trying to think, like, well, I don't want to read the daggone sermon. I just want to preach the sermon, right? But for years, the only way that I could do it, I was familiar with this, this thing. So I, even if, you know, even if I really, really tried hard, it would, it was like a safety blanket. It was like, it was familiar, right? And finally, I I read this book by a guy named Andy Stanley, and it was called Communicating for a Change. And in the book, one of the things that he asks is, why are you preaching? Like, what's the point of you preaching? What, What are you trying to do? And, and I realized that in my mind, in my mind, what I thought I was trying to do was convey information. If I'm, if I'm just trying to convey information, like I could send that in an email right? What he said in the book was really interesting. He said, preaching is about life change. Preaching is, is so that people leave differently than when they came. So, so, and then he kind of gave you a, a different, he gave me a different flow, a different format, a different style. And, and after having read that book, having a little shift in my mind, stepping into something that wasn't so comfortable, getting out of my comfort zone, I actually walked up for the first time, maybe probably four years into being a pastor. And I didn't bring my 14 page transcript with me. And I was terrified, but I did it and I preached and it turned out at least for me. Okay. And so from that day forward, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I don't, I still write a transcript. It's in the front row right over there. If you want to read it, I'll email it to you. It might be better than the sermon. If you're not getting anything out of the sermon, there's good stuff in that, in that transcript. Let me believe me. Um, but, but the, but the point was it wasn't until I was willing to step into the unfamiliar right? That I could move forward into what I was trying to do and what I was trying to accomplish. God is trying to tell us today, somebody today, stop relying on what the way it was in the past, because that may or may not be the way that I'm trying to move you into the future, right? We want to move forward into what God has for us, not attach ourselves to the way things used to be. Are you with me this morning? Some of our leaders, some of our business leaders, I want you to just hold on to that. Because a lot of times people will say, why do we do things the way we're doing them? And if the answer is because we've always done them that way, that answer needs to be crushed up and thrown into a waste paper basket. Because it it might not be the way things need to to go now, because that just was the way it used to be. Just because you anointed a tall, strapping, good-looking guy the first time doesn't mean that that's what you're going to anoint the second time. Amen, somebody? So let me go one step deeper, and then I'm going to close. All the, you know... Eliab is not the one, right? So then the scripture says that all the sons, all of the sons come up one by one. That's not that one. It's not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Then the Lord, the, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Right? Is that all you got, Jesse? Like, is that, is that it? And I love Jesse's response. Remember, he says, they're still the youngest. Um, he is tending the sheep. What he's really saying here is, 
this guy, I didn't even come up on my radar. Like I'm just, he's not, I'm just telling you. He's, he's a kid, he's dirty, he throws rocks at animals, he's driving goats out of the thing. He's not your guy. I, didn't, I wouldn't even think of him, right? So it wasn't, fami- it wasn't fear, it wasn't familiarity. You know what it was? It was false assumptions. Sometimes we make false assumptions about what God can do through us or in us or to us because we just haven't seen it done that way before. A lot of commentators think that David was between 10 and 15 years old during this time. And by the way, listen to this. David was the only guy at the party who wasn't consecrated. He was the only guy at the party that hadn't washed his hair and cut his fingernails and washed his clothes and got his act together. They went and dragged him out of the field. Here comes this stinky little 12-year-old guy. And you know what Samuel said? God said to Samuel and Samuel said, this is the one. So here's what I want to say to you today. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you, what you did last summer. It doesn't matter where you've been. God, God, is, God can use whatever God wants to use, whoever God wants to use, whenever God wants to use it. So don't assume, don't assume that because you don't measure up to some standard that you have in your mind or you haven't gotten all cleaned up yet or you're not consecrated, sanctified, and holy yet that God can't use you. God can use whoever he wants to use. And God wants to use you. God wants to use you the way you are right here, right now. He wants to bring you into his, in, in, into his mission, into his vision, into his destiny. So stop assuming things that aren't true. All right, I'm going to close with this. Close with this. Last scripture. The Lord said to Samuel, this is the first scripture and it's the last scripture. How long will you mourn for Saul? How long are you going to hold on to the past? Because I need you to release I need you to release the past. Why? I rejected him as king over Israel. I need you to fill your horn. I need you to release and refill. In the scripture, the, the, the oil that's in the horn is always representative of the power of the Holy Spirit. God is saying to us through this scripture, he's saying, I need you to release some stuff from the past. I need you to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. I need your life to be filled with me. I need you to remove some stuff from your, from your old life and to be filled with some stuff for your new, your horn with oil and be on your way. I've got somewhere for you to go. I've got a destiny for you. I've got a mission for you. I've got a, he's saying I've got a vision for this church and each person in it. And it may or may not be the vision that you have for your own life. May not be that. So don't be afraid of what he has for you. Don't attach yourself to what's familiar. Don't make assumptions about what God can or cannot do. Open your heart and be filled with his power. Be filled with the truth of his gospel. Be filled with the power of his spirit. Release and be refilled. A few weeks back, I finally, gently, kindly coaxed Augustine to get on his brother's orange bike. And he was barely able to touch the, the ground, you know, with his toes on this 16-inch bike. So I said, come on, baby, let's, you know, you can keep the, keep, you know, keep your Lightning McQueen helmet, but let's just try a different bike. So he gets on the bike, and we go for a ride, Jameson, Lincoln, Gustin, and me. And now he's on 16-inch wheels. He's feeling the power of the 16-inch wheel. Now, it doesn't have the decals, right? But he's experiencing something new, something that he was afraid of, something that's unfamiliar. He might have had some assumptions about what would happen if he got on this bike that just weren't justified. So he gets on this bike. Now he's tearing out through the neighborhood, right? We get back to the the garage. You know, Lightning McQueen was great, but Lightning McQueen ain't so great no more. So, So two weeks ago, we took Lightning McQueen and we took him out to the sidewalk and we put a little sign on the silver handlebars that said, free and about an hour later i look out the window and lightning mcqueen's gone lightning mcqueen is gone right lightning some three-year-old in university city is graduating up to lightning mcqueen this week and having the time of his life right but augustine had to move on from what was familiar he had to move on from what was holding him back today i just want to say to you i want to say to each and every one of us let's let's do this Let's release 
what we need to let go of. Release what God has rejected. Be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so you can anoint your future. Let's release and refill. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Your word is so good. It is nourishment to our soul. It is food for our soul and our spirit. We thank you for filling us today, God. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would just take what you have planted in our heart today and we would walk it out. We would live it out. We would step into what you have for us. God, some of us are being called to take that first step, be a part of this church, join the family. Help us to take that step today, to step into the unfamiliar, to not be afraid, to go into it. Some of us are being called to lead life groups. Help us to step into it, God. Some of us are being called, Lord, to to join the dream team. Help us to step into what you have for us. To let go of what we have been doing in the past, the familiar, the thing that we're afraid to let go of. Let us step into what you have for us in 2020. Transform us by the power of your spirit. Let us be moved, God, into what you have for us. Let us release our fears, our anxieties, our false assumptions, that which is familiar, and let us be filled, God, by the power of your spirit. Lead us into your destiny for us, we pray, to your glory, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen.